I'm going to fight for every citizen who believes that government should serve the people, not the donors and not the special interests. But one thing I can promise you this. I will always tell you the truth. We are not merely transferring power from one administration to another or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. Populism is not just a right-wing ideology, irrespective of what these clips might suggest. An article written for The New Yorker during the run-up to the 2016 presidential election discusses the new populism emerging at the time that connotes a deep suspicion of political, corporate and media elites, an eagerness to mobilise people who are new to politics, and a willingness to embrace policies that have long seemed verboten. On the right, this has meant proposals to crack down on immigrants, Muslims and outsiders of all kinds. On the left, it has meant demands to downsize big banks, crack down on tax-dodging multinationals, shift to a more progressive tax system, and get serious about curbing carbon emissions. The article states that both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump were tapping into many of the same popular sentiments to appeal to voters. But I must admit, I will be focusing mostly on the right-wing populism side of things in this video. So, what exactly is populism? It's a topic of debate in academic circles, and there's a lot to consider, but across these debates, researchers tend to agree populism has two core principles. One, it must claim to speak on behalf of ordinary people, and two, these ordinary people must stand in opposition to an elite establishment which stops them from fulfilling their political preferences. It's the I'm one of you rhetoric, the I only speak plainly, there's no guff here, the now is the time for hard and fast change that will benefit you, the people. In a basic sense, it's an ideology that sounds appealing. Quick, systematic change that benefits the working people and seeks to take down the out-of-touch elites. But it is, of course, not that simple. For one thing, who are the people? The idea of making changes for the people implies that all people want the same things and feel the same way. And of course, they don't. The very construction of the people runs the risk of ostracising portions of society that don't fit within this group. And of course, it's the kind of rhetoric that can be used to exploit and manipulate ordinary people to act or vote in a certain way because they believe that doing so will benefit them, when, in actual fact, it will only benefit those in power. But what does all this have to do with Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, a play written over 400 years earlier than the 2016 American election and the ensuing presidency of Donald Trump? Well, the answer, as it turns out, is a lot. In early June 2017, the Public Theatre's Shakespeare in the Park production of Julius Caesar premiered at the Delacorte Theatre in Central Park, New York. Shakespeare in the Park is a long-standing New York City tradition. Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, a play that features the assassination of the titular character about halfway through, has been staged countless times in theatres across the world. But this time, something was different. The actor playing Caesar was blonde, he smoked cigars, wore a business suit and an overlong tie. Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, was played by a slim woman with a Slavic accent. When in Act 1, Scene 2, Caesar instructs Antony to touch Calpurnia in a ritualistic bid to ensure her fertility as he begins his race, he engages in what Trump had referred to as grabbing women by the pussy. These are among a few of the decisions taken by director Oscar Eustace and his company that frame the titular character, Julius Caesar, as the then newly minted president, Donald Trump. On one hand, what Eustace and co are doing is no different to what has been done for hundreds of years with regards to the staging of this play. Since it was first performed at the Globe in 1599, directors and theatre companies have capitalised on the play's shrewd depiction of dictatorship, war, mob rule, revolution and manipulation to respond to contemporary political events and situations. There have been plenty of different interpretations of the text, some that see Brutus, leader of the conspirators who delivers the final blow against Caesar, as the unquestioned protagonist and revolutionary hero, whereas others present Caesar as the more sympathetic character and Brutus as the antagonist. This is part of what makes the play brilliant. Shakespeare leaves the question of goodies versus baddies deliberately open. 
Orson Welles's 1937 landmark production of Julius Caesar addressed the dangers of fascism while prioritising an equal insistence on the limits and cluelessness of liberalism, and this was, in part, possible because of the text's ambiguous moral stance. Wells himself said Shakespeare has feelings for and against everyone in the play. It's up to the reader, director and audience to decide for themselves who, if anyone, is in the right. But when Eustace staged his version of the play, it was caught in a tidal wave of opposition and political strife. Julius Caesar opened on Monday amid controversy because the actor playing Caesar looks an awful lot like President Donald Trump. This year's production of Julius Caesar depicts Caesar as a President Trump look-alike who's stabbed to death on stage. The theater company behind New York's famous Shakespeare in the Park is playing defense after major sponsors pulled out of its new production of Julius Caesar. And there's no mistaking the Trump connection. Check out the unbuttoned overcoat and red tie that hangs over his waist. So you don't have a problem with them depicting Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump look. No, I, th I think they always try to push the push the envelope a little bit, and uh, that's what they're doing. Terrible, absolutely terrible. I think they meant a great president. Of course not, it's not appropriate. Well, it doesn't matter to me. Trump is the president. I respect him. I just want to see my play. With all the crazy stuff going on in the world, that's not a good look at all. Ooh, that's a little morbid. It's just tragic. It's, it's sad that that's what our country is, is becoming in many ways. Complete hypocrisy. It's sick. Um, and look at what's happened now. It's encouraging violence against Republicans. It's scary, and we live in really frightening times. The reaction to the play was intense. As Chris Thurman writes, the Trump GOP Fox News Breitbart alt-right complex went into protesting overdrive, roundly condemning the perceived slight, nay, the treason of caricaturing the American president and, worse, hinting at his assassination. Eustace and his actors received death threats, and there were numerous incitements to violent action against both the Playhouse and playgoers. Local and federal law enforcement authorities deployed to oversee the final week of the run. Compare this to another adaptation of the play for the Bridge Theatre in London, directed by Nicholas Heitner, which I fully recommend watching on National Theatre at Home if you have the chance. Heitner also portrayed Caesar as a Trump-esque figure wearing a Make Rome Great Again hat. In Heitner's production, you could pay for a standing ticket so you, as an audience member, could stand in the crowd, interspersed with the actors who come to protest the assassination of Caesar, in character. If you come to see the play at the bridge, Heitner wrote in January 2018, you can choose to be one of those suckers. We've taken the seats out of the stalls so you can stand and be part of the crowd. In Eustace's production, plainclothes actors were planted in the audience. They would sit quietly watching the play and then get up from their seats at the right time to protest Caesar's assassination. Both directorial decisions from Heitner and from Eustace forced the audience to confront their participation in the mob. They aren't just distant spectators above the din. They're shoulder to shoulder with the people angrily demanding answers. Now, Heitner's production wasn't met with anything like the level of outrage that Eustace's was. Eustace's production, and I think the levels of Inception here are fascinating, was protested by real life actual audience members storming the stage and disturbing the performance. So not only do you have actors getting up from the audience and protesting the death of Caesar, but you have paying audience members protesting the depiction of the assassination of Trump. The line between play and reality was confused. Supporters of the president said that the assassination scene promoted the growing violence of the left towards the right. Here's protester Laura Loomer explaining why she interrupted a performance. Why was this then so important to you? This has been really important to me because the left has systematically and programmatically used uh, free speech and artistic expression as a pretext to incite violence against the right and promote the assassination of President Donald Trump. And that's really problematic. Yeah, look, this is assassination porn, right? So the left is taking pleasure in, in watching an assassination attempt on President Trump. Shakespeare once said that violent delights uh, lead to violent ends, right? And so when you're going to delight in the assassination of our president, it's going to have a violent end. I'm protecting um, the president's life. I'm uh, protecting our constitution. I'm using my constitutional right to, of free speech and protest to protest against the bastardization of Shakespeare, really. Luma was protecting the president and protecting the right by challenging Eustace's depiction. But Eustace claimed he wasn't looking to incite violence at all. 
and that in fact his adaptation of the play should serve as a reminder about what happens when democracy, when the outcome of an election unfavourable to some, is met with violence. Neither Shakespeare nor the public theatre could possibly advocate violence as a solution to political problems, and certainly not assassination. This play, on the contrary, warns about what happens when you try to preserve democracy by non-democratic means. And again, spoiler alert, it doesn't end up too good. James Shapiro, who was in the audience, corroborates Eustace's vision here. He describes how, in the run-up to the assassination scene, a lot of the references to Trump were met with a sort of knowing laughter. But the assassination itself completely changed the tone and stunned the audience. Eustace had set a trap. He was offering a counterpoint, a rival perspective. It was as if he had slammed on the brakes and 1800 playgoers were experiencing whiplash. What had we been wishing for? By giving voice to the opposition, he was forcing on playgoers a set of moral questions, not unlike those Brutus was struggling with. Do the ends justify the means? How do we reconcile our values with our desires? Eustace's production wasn't a call to arms. It was designed to give pause, to get the audience to question their own morals, according to Eustace. And as Shapiro suggests, at no point was this directorial decision an attempt at promoting violence. The anger of the pro-Trump protesters looking to protect the right from leftist violence to protect the president was misplaced. Not least because the assassination scene seemed to be taken wildly out of context during the ensuing aftermath. In an article bearing the subheading, Why Delta Airlines Pulled Their Funding from Oscar Eustace's Trump-inspired production of Julius Caesar and not from my Obama-inspired one, let that sink in for a second. Director of the aforementioned Obama-inspired 2012 production of Julius Caesar, Rob Melrose, writes, It's clear that most of those outraged by the public theatre's Trumpian emperor either didn't see the play or didn't stay to the end. The Breitbart article that started the controversy is, I kid you not, a review by someone who talked to someone who saw the show. This second order correspondent also thinks the play ends with the death of Caesar, as if they are killing the bad guy at the end of a superhero movie. In fact, the assassination takes place in the middle of the play. If this was the case, if people in the pro-Trump camp didn't actually watch the play and focused only on the assassination scene, that means they missed the scene that succeeds it. And this scene, otherwise known as Act 3, Scene 2, is one of the most stunning examples of rhetoric, coercion and manipulation I've ever encountered. I'm going to analyse it in detail, but first it's probably a good idea for you to have a full understanding of the play's plot to situate this scene within. So, here goes. The action begins in Rome, as Caesar returns home triumphant, having won the war he was fighting against the sons of his old enemy, Pompey. There are celebrations in the streets, and Caesar is lavished with praise. Games are held in honour of his victory, including a race in which Mark Antony, Caesar's right-hand man, takes part. Sure, an old man comes up to him and warns him to beware the Ides of March, but celebrations are afoot. This is no time for superstitious nonsense. The fun and games continue. But not everyone partakes of this celebratory mood. Brutus and Cassius are concerned over Caesar's ever-increasing power. Cassius is in the let's murder him camp more or less from the off, but Brutus is on the fence. Brutus and Cassius hear from Casca that Caesar has been offered the crown three times and has each time refused it, in a display that seems to imply that Caesar is rejecting total control and power. But the conspirators aren't convinced. Cassius, Casca and the conspirators effectively manipulate Brutus into joining their cause and they start plotting Caesar's assassination. Brutus is visibly troubled by this and his wife, Portia, clocks on, but he won't tell her what he and the conspirators have been planning. Meanwhile, Caesar is also refusing the wisdom of his wife. Calpurnia tells him that she has had a bad dream that portents his death, and she urges him not to go to the Senate today on the Ides of March, which at first he agrees to. But then one of the conspirators turns up and effectively flatters him enough that he goes back on his word and makes for the Senate. There, he is stabbed to death by the conspirators, with Brutus delivering the fatal blow at which Caesar utters his famous last line, et tu, Brute? then fall Caesar. Not long after, in comes Mark Antony and finds the conspirators covered in the blood of Caesar, and he seems to reconcile with them, shaking their hands. After they've all left the Senate, however, he swears vengeance upon them. Let slip the dogs of war. 
catching wind of the drama, the plebeians, who were lately celebrating Caesar's return, are now demanding answers. They first hear from Brutus, who says he murdered Caesar to prevent him from becoming too powerful and too ambitious. Brutus then, to his detriment, hands the crowd over to Mark Antony, who delivers his famous funeral oration, during which the crowd go from supporting Brutus to vying for his blood. Mark Antony has truly riled up the people. A group of angry citizens murder Sinner the Poet in the streets, despite his protestations that he is indeed Sinner the Poet and not his namesake, Sinner the Conspirator, who helped to kill Caesar. The group of citizens just don't care, and blood is spilled. Brutus and Cassius go to war against Mark Antony, who has joined forces with Caesar's nephew, Octavius. Everything has gone to hell at this point. There are rifts between Brutus and Cassius. Brutus hears that his wife, Portia, has taken her own life. And he also has a run-in with Caesar's ghost, leaving him distressed and restless on the evening before battle. As battle commences, it initially seems as though Brutus' side is winning the fight. But things take a mistaken turn, and Cassius is led to assume that they are losing. Believing all is lost, he asks his servant to kill him. When Brutus finds Cassius's body, he decides that taking his own life is the only honourable thing to do. So he does. Antony's side wins the war. Antony finds Brutus's body, deems him the noblest Roman of them all, stating that Brutus was the only conspirator who acted on the behalf of Rome and not out of personal interest. A proper funeral will be arranged for Brutus, and Antony, along with Octavius, head off to celebrate their victory. Caesar is assassinated in Act 3, Scene 1, which is of course followed by Act 3, Scene 2, in which first Brutus, then Antony, address the plebeians, or the ordinary people, who are demanding to be satisfied, i.e. find out what the hell is going on. It's a short scene, but it contains some stunning examples of persuasive rhetoric, and by the end the crowd goes from honouring noble Brutus and his justification for assassinating Caesar to vying for his blood and threatening to burn his house down in less than 300 lines. And I have to mention another level of inception here, because just as the plebeians rally to burn the house of Brutus, protesters of Eustace's production threaten to burn the theatre down, one angry email warning that if ever a theatre should burn to the ground, it's yours. Surreal. Anyway, how does Antony's clever rhetoric turn the tide of the crowd so dramatically and so quickly? The scene opens as Brutus stands to address the crowd. The plebeians are on Brutus's side. I will hear Brutus speak. The noble Brutus is ascended. Silence. He then delivers a monologue that begins, Romans, countrymen and lovers. Lovers here meaning friends. Let's compare this to the opening line of Mark Antony's monologue. So after Brutus's monologue, he leaves as Antony enters with Caesar's body. The crowd at this point are still firmly on Brutus's side. Live, Brutus! Live! Live! Bring him with triumph home unto his house. Give him a statue with his ancestors! Let him be Caesar. Caesar's better parts shall be crowned in Brutus. We'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamours. Brutus even tells the crowd to listen to Antony, to grace his speech before he departs. And the crowd are like, well, yeah, okay, but don't say anything bad about Brutus or we'll get you. Then Antony speaks. Rather than Romans, countrymen and lovers, Antony begins, and this is one of Shakespeare's most famous monologues, I might add, Friends, Romans, countrymen. Brutus appeals to the crowd by reminding them of their civic duty. Above all else, they are Romans, first and foremost. Antony does the opposite. Before their patriotic duties as Romans, the crowd are friends. His language warms him to the crowd, appealing to them from the off on an intimate, emotional level. Brutus's monologue, as a whole, isn't especially emotive. As Xin Yao Zhao writes, Brutus's speech is, to a fault, cold and logical, like a thoroughly stoic performance devoid of appeal to the audience's pathos. Antony, conversely, goes straight in with all the feels. He's outwardly overcome by his own emotions, pausing mid-monologue. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. The plebeians are phased by this. They consider it evidence of Antony's noble nature. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. If Brutus assumes that his rationalisation, combined with his moral character, is sufficient to convince the mob of the righteousness of his actions, Antony relies on his emotive appeal. 
But he does more than just show his feelings. Antony takes Brutus's noble nature and uses it against him. As Zhao writes, it's precisely Brutus's honour, his most important credential, that Antony in his speech undercuts with an ingenious use of irony. Let's look into that in more detail. What is it to be noble? To be honourable? These are some of the questions I find myself asking when I read or watch this scene. Throughout his monologue, Antony returns to the refrain, And Brutus is an honourable man. So he repeats something like a three-part formula, if you like, that goes, Caesar did some good stuff, but Brutus says he was too ambitious and needed stopping, and Brutus is an honourable man, and hence worthy of believing. Sure enough, repeating this refrain over and over while drip-feeding the plebeians examples of Caesar's good qualities and actions begins to take effect. If the primary reason Brutus gives for assassinating Caesar is that he was too ambitious, Antony undercuts that accusation. And here's an example of that. Now, Caesar, in real life and in the play, was not a king, and this is important. According to legend, the Romans had banished their last king in 509 BC when they founded the Republic and vowed never to be ruled by kings again. So for any leader to demand or accept the crown was a risky move, it suggested that they wanted divine and total power. Earlier in the play, Caesar is offered the crown three times, and three times refuses it. As Antony recalls, as Antony recalls, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says that he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honourable man. Antony's use of this refrain is clever and subversive. He's saying, hey, I know Brutus is great, you know, he's noble, he's honourable. And also here are some facts about Caesar that disprove everything Brutus has said and done. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Noble and honourable begin to lose meaning. Shakespeare is challenging us, his audience, his crowd of plebeians, to really consider what we mean if we say someone is honourable or that an act is honourable. Is it ever okay to kill for the sake of honour? Who decides who is an honourable man? Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honourable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead and wrong myself and you, then I will wrong such honourable men." Antony chips away at that idea of honour. And not only this, but he's aligning himself with the common people. They have all been wronged by the conspirators together. And here we can begin to see how Antony is using rhetorical tactics that when politicians use them today, we might call populist. Honour. What it means, and who has it, is scrutinised and unravelled. Antony invokes the pity of the crowd when he says, I fear I wrong the honourable men. He doesn't know what he's doing, really. He's no shrewd orator like the honourable Brutus. He's trying his best. And all this means he can manipulate the crowd into feeling as though they are in control. Antony tells the crowd he has Caesar's will, but that he can't share it with them. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Though he seems reluctant to incite the crowd to violence against the conspirators, that's exactly what he wants. He manipulates them into doing so indirectly, and in a way that works to wash his hands of any responsibility. Remind you of anything? We have a breach of the capital. Breach of the capital to the upper level. And we've got more of that emotive language in which he appeals to their humanity. They're not wood nor stone. They have feelings and those feelings are real and valid. Then he goes a step further, literally asking the crowd's permission to come down from his pulpit where he's been stood addressing them. You will compel me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come, come down. down. Descend. You shall have leave. Not only is Antony asking their permission, putting them in the position of power, but he's coming down to their level physically. No longer is he railing above them. He joins them and at their request. And note the language the plebeians use. You shall have leave. See how easily they themselves assume a position of power, how quickly they feel comfortable. Antony is pitiable. He's relatable. And he flatters his audience by giving them power over him, or so they believe. Then we get to the nitty gritty, 
the viscerality of the situation, the body. Antony's next monologue is an intimate, close reading of Caesar's corpse. It's forensic. He laments over individual stab wounds, pairing each wound with the conspirator that caused it. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it. It's hard to remember Brutus's reasons for killing Caesar when faced with the real, gory, visceral injury done to him, the fresh corpse, the victim. Here, in the streets, level with the crowd, is Antony, recreating the violence in words. And this stands in stark contrast to Brutus delivering a cold and brief address. Antony's emotive, passionate, vulnerable speech is punctuated by happy reminiscences of Caesar's triumphs. Antony works the crowd like a puppet master, riling them up and pulling them back until they're chomping at the bit. Oh, piteous spectacle. Oh, noble Caesar. Oh, woeful day. Oh, traitors, villains. Oh, most bloody sight. We will be revenged. Revenge, Revenge about, about, seek, burn, burn fire, fire, kill, slay. Let, let not, not a traitor, traitor live. live. Stay, countrymen. Peace there. Hear the noble Antony. This is interesting. There's a real sense of mob mentality here. The crowd all seem to copy each other with those O's, and then they're all chanting these single words, revenge, about, seek, burn, etc., evoking their single-mindedness and thoughtlessness. Again, Antony is manipulating them by inciting them to violence, by telling them not to be violent. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. And then we get to the crux of what Antony is doing. We get to the lines at the heart of his strategy. The crowd trust Antony. They do what he says because he is just like them. They that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honourable and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I'm no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. There's an awful lot going on here. Antony again points to the honour of the conspirators. He sets himself up as the good guy, who is trying to give these conspirators the benefit of the doubt, trying to understand them, in spite of this bloody corpse strewn in front of them all. It's very, you know, what would Jesus do? He's trying to turn the other cheek, trying to be as compassionate as possible. He assures the crowd that the conspirators will, with reason, provide answers. Now, this is interesting because, again, we see vividly the wedge between Brutus's cold, logical reasoning and Antony's passionate emotional reaction. The people, riled up as they are, frothing with emotion, aren't in the state of mind in which they can listen to reason, which Antony readily exploits. Then we get to the real meat of the speech. I am no orator as Brutus is. Antony is plain blunt. He just loves his friend who's been killed. He has no wit, no words, no worth. Not like the eloquent Brutus. He's saying something like, I'm not good with words. I don't have the power to sway you. But the way he's saying it, in impassioned rhetorical verse that plays on the audience's emotions, contradicts that. Brutus is actually much more direct than Antony. Really, he's the one who's speaking plainly. Yet his straightforward prose appeals to the crowd's reason and not their emotions. And it's easy enough for Antony to twist this and paint Brutus as the distant, elitist, unrelatable politician. Antony, just like Trump in those clips at the start of this video, is a straight shooting, no nonsense kind of guy. I only speak right on. I'm one of you. He has the interests of the people at heart, in contrast to Brutus, who addresses the plebeians briefly in a monologue where he refers to himself 28 times in only a handful of lines. It's hard not to view Brutus by this point as out of touch with the people, and Antony firmly on their side, ready to help them take Brutus down. No more so-called elites lording over you, telling you what to think. I tell you that which you yourselves do know, says Antony, appealing to the crowd's vanity, making them feel heard, valid, valued and free when in actual fact, he's manipulating them for his own ends. 
He then seals the deal by revealing that Caesar has left money to all the plebeians in his will. I want to hone in on these two excellent lines. On what might not be immediately clear is an exquisitely veiled insult levied at the plebeians, and even at we, the audience. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. Caesar's wounds are described as mouths, a connection that's not hard to make. A gaping stab wound isn't unlike the shape of an open mouth. The wounds are mouths in that they can communicate what happened to Caesar better than Antony can. But poor, poor dumb mouths has a double meaning. Those dumb mouths are the mouths of the dumb plebeians, gaping, unable to speak for themselves because they've been so manipulated. In fact, Antony can now bid them speak for me, and there's a further layer to this insult. So, we know by this point that Shakespeare is forcing us, his audience, to participate and confront our own role within the crowd. And we get that again in these two lines. How? Well, you could argue that the poor, poor, dumb mouths belong to the audience as well as the crowd within the play. If you wanted to visit the Globe in 1599, but you couldn't afford a seat in the theatre, for just a penny, you could pay to stand in the pit right in front of the stage. And you can still do this. You can pay like five pounds to get a standing ticket at the Globe today. So you pay your penny and you might get sore legs from standing up hour upon hour, but you still get to watch the play and you're very close to the action. However, to watch the show from down there, looking up at the actors delivering their lines on stage, earns you the rather insulting name Groundling. A groundling was the name of a small fish with a gaping mouth. You, having paid your penny, aren't too dissimilar from this fish, gormless, wide-eyed, staring up blankly from the ground on which you stand. We are the groundlings, staring up, agog. So not only is Antony insulting the plebeians, but you could make the case that Shakespeare is insulting us, his groundlings, the masses, the ordinary people gawping at the action. He's forcing us to reckon with our role as part of a society, to reckon with how much we might allow ourselves to be manipulated by the words of those in power. Cultivating more of an awareness when it comes to when and how we might be manipulated and by whom is exactly what I believe is important when listening to politicians and forming our own views and ideologies. So does Julius Caesar have anything to do with contemporary politics? Absolutely. As Nicholas Heitner observes, Julius Caesar addresses directly the failure of dismayed liberals, count me as one of them, to understand and overcome the appeal of populism. It exposes the manipulative half-truths and outright falsehoods that are the populists' stock in trade. Octavia Bryant and Benjamin Moffat, in their article on populism for the conversation, cite research that demonstrated how Trump's rhetoric during the 2016 campaign was highly populist. He targeted political elites, drawing on the core populist feature of anti-elitism, and frequently used people-centric language, with a strong use of collective pronouns of our and we. Not a far cry from the techniques adopted by Antony in Act 3, Scene 2, and not without the same violent and inflammatory effects. Now, in terms of the play itself, as Shakespeare wrote it, I don't think Mark Antony is in the wrong. I don't think Brutus is either. And I think that's the whole point of the play. In conflict, everyone believes they're fighting for honour, for the greater good, and it's entirely a matter of perspective. Like in A Midsummer Night's Dream, any sense of Shakespeare's own political or moral takes are cloaked in ambiguity, deliberately, I believe, to get us, the audience, to reflect on what we actually think and feel. We're not allowed to sit as objective observers. We are the masses. And Shakespeare's refusal to tell us what to think and feel about Caesar's death, about who is the antagonist, forces us to reckon with our own biases and culpability. But what do you think? Have you seen an adaptation of Julius Caesar? Who do you think is the villain and who the hero? I find this topic so interesting, so please let me know what you think in the comments. Mouse and I wish you the very best navigating your own political beliefs and ethical standpoints, and we'll see you in the next video. Oh, pity a spectacle!